So first of all, I want to express my thanks to the Izzat and Christensen families for making these series of lectures possible. It's been a great treat for me to come here to BYU, not my first time, I think it's my third or fourth time uh, to the university, to see old friends, uh, meet new people in the faculties in chemistry and chemical engineering, and hear about the research that you're doing. Now, the topic of this lecture has an interesting origin. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it before I get into the uh, topic itself. Uh, a number of years ago, I had the uh, pleasure of serving on a National Research Council uh, committee, also DOE committees, to look at energy resources, how we deploy them, how do we think about what is in the future. And then six years ago, uh, my oldest granddaughter, uh, was finishing high school, and she said, uh, came to me on a visit and said, Granddad, you know, I'd like you to give a talk at my high school. This is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and I'd like you to talk about energy. Since you're a chemical engineer, obviously you know something about this. And I had never done anything like this before, but I didn't want to disappoint my granddaughter. So I said yes. I prepared for this uh, lecture uh, more than usual. And it was a great hit, uh, and <clears throat> it taught me uh, how to put things into perspective. Then uh, four years ago, uh, there was a discussion at the university level at Berkeley about teaching uh, undergraduates something about sustainable energy. And I did then a survey of what was available uh, around the campus. And there were many um, uh, courses in the College of Natural Resources and other places, but nothing that was technical and nothing that was quantitative. And so I put together a sophomore level course. I've now taught three times on the fundamentals, scientific and engineering fundamentals of sustainable energy. So what you're going to hear in the next hour is an amalgam of my service for the DOE, for the National Research Council, for my granddaughter, and for the undergraduates at Berkeley. So let me start <clears throat> with a little bit of an outline here. What we're going to do first is talk about the relationships between energy and the economy, uh, not just the US economy, but world economies, and try to understand uh, why is energy so important. Uh, next, we'll ask, uh, where does this energy come from? And what are the resources? And are they finite or are they uh, infinite? If they were infinite, of course, we can sustain the, their use forever. It's not a problem. And are there consequences of using the resources that we do have? And this will lead us then to talk about the motivations for looking at alternative energy resources. And I'll try to convince you uh, as we go through this that ultimately we have to think about the sun as the sustainable energy source that will provide us uh, at least a thousand years of um, energy for uh, civilization as we know it. Closely connected to this is the use of biomass as a source of carbon. Uh, there's certainly in the US plenty of biomass, enough to provide a significant fraction of the fuels, transportation fuels we need. And the question is, how might you convert this in such a way that you don't make, uh, do more damage than good? Uh, you, you intend to do good, but sometimes there are unintended consequences. And we'll see next that to do good, you need a source of hydrogen. And uh, uh, we'll talk about how you can get that hydrogen using solar energy. And then I'll have a few remarks on how we might take CO2 back out of the atmosphere. There's enough CO2 in the atmosphere today, globally, to provide all the carbon-based fuels we need, except it's there in a very dilute uh, form. <clears throat> and finally, I'll have a few concluding remarks. So let's start by talking about energy and the economy. So here's a plot of GDP per capita on the uh, y-axis versus kilowatts expended per capita. <coughs> Excuse me. And you see a number of countries on this uh, plot. The USA is in the upper uh, right-hand uh, corner. Uh, Japan is over here. Uh, Germany is in this red circle. Um, and so you can see how each country is doing. This is plot is a few years old, but it's still relevant. What you notice right away is that the more advanced countries spend a lot of energy per capita, but they also make a lot of uh, 
products and services per capita, and that translates into GDP. Now, I've drawn in some straight lines here to guide the eye, and the slope of these lines tells you something about the efficiency. So the higher the slope, uh, the more efficient the country is in using its energy. So, for example, Japan is much more efficient than the U.S., and Germany is somewhere in between. But the good news is that everybody's moving upwards. With time, every country's energy exp expenditure per GDP is moving towards that of Japan. So the next question then is, where does the energy come from? <clears throat> well, for the last 100 years or so, we can name three principal sources. And it doesn't matter whether you talk about the US, you talk about Europe, you talk about Asia, other parts of the world. Uh, the pre principal sources, and for the US it's 86%, come from petroleum, natural gas, and coal. Now the balance between these changes with time. If you look at the US, uh, back in the 19th century, we're principally a coal economy. Then we switched to petroleum, and now we're <clears throat> utilizing more and more natural gas. 8% uh, comes from nuclear, and only 5% is from uh, renewable resources. How do we use this energy and how efficiently? So this is a nice chart from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory that summarizes everything in one plot. So on the left are the sources. Uh, so solar on the top, petroleum on the bottom. The total for the US is 100 units. It happens to be quads, but don't worry about that unit. I don't expect everybody to know what a quad is, but it's a large amount of energy. So 100. But roughly a third of it goes to use uh, for electrical generation, <clears throat> and this is principally through the use of natural gas, uh, coal, uh, et cetera, uh, with a little bit from uh, nuclear and uh, solar. A third of it goes for commercial use and home heating, and the rest goes uh, to transportation, so uh, ground transportation, automobiles, trucks, and aviation. Now, of the total amount that we put in, 100 units, only 42% does something useful. The rest is just wasted. And that waste energy uh, also results in uh, the generation of CO2, as we'll see. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the electrical energy generation is only 32%, and transportation, automobiles, as we know them today, only 25%. So we, we're not very efficient in using uh, the energy that we have. <clears throat> now, what are the motivations for moving on and looking at alternatives? Uh, there are two principal ones. The first is as we start to uh, look at an assay of the reserves of coal, petroleum, and natural gas, we realize that these are finite. Yes, there have been successes in the last 10 years or so with fracking, so uh, uh, opening up the porosity of shale <clears throat> and extracting natural gas from that and petroleum. This will extend our resources, but as you'll see in a minute, they're still finite. And the second big uh, point here is that the consumption of fossil energy is contributing to the rapid rise in CO2 in the atmosphere, more so than has been seen in tens of thousands of years of uh, uh, the record that we have for the Earth. And this has consequences for global warming. And I'll talk about this in a minute. So first, about uh, the finite resources. So on the left, you have a plot of the global oil and gas production profiles starting from 1930 and running out to 2050. And the vertical uh, red line is where we are today at 2015. So what's obvious is that when you sum up all possible sources of oil and gas, We've been consuming more and more, producing more and more, and just about today, we're at the peak. Now, we can extend the future to some extent, maybe 10% or more, but somewhere between the middle of this century and certainly by the end of the century, we will be back to having the kind of resources that we had in the early part of the previous century. So that gives you pause to think. On the right, we see what is the world consumption. Uh, so the, uh, the uh, uh, industrialized countries were on the rise, but their uh, consumption has now more or less plateaued out. That's the uh, bluish line here. 
The developing countries, though, want to be like the developed countries, and so they want to have the kind of GDP uh, per capita that we have, and so they're starting to use more and more energy. And this is causing the consumption of energy to rise. So if you look at countries like China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, soon Africa, parts of Africa, uh, this is causing the rise. And this is happening at the rate of somewhere between one and a half and two percent. It's slowed down recently because the economy has slowed down worldwide, but it's still on a positive um, uh, uh, slope upwards. Uh, gas, uh, and I take this picture for the U.S. because I have the best uh, data for that. Uh, we were producing less and less gas until very recently. So this uh, uh, zone over here, which says shale gas, this dark brown area, is the result in roughly 2005-06 of the uh, introduction of this technology of fracking. And that's taken off like a bandit and is producing an increasing fraction of the total gas the U.S. consumes and has made gas very cheap, which is good for our economy. But this is finite, too. And if we extend <coughs> out to the end of the uh, century, <coughs> we'll see that these resources are going to decline as well. Okay, so I mentioned the consequences of using fossil energy, and here's one way to look at it. Uh, here's a plot of atmospheric CO2 going back to 400,000 years before our time. Now, that's a really long time ago. And you see that there have been major oscillations uh, here between, uh, say, 150 and maybe 275 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere that go up and down with long time cycles, but they're timed more or less to the uh, glacial periods uh, that have been experienced by the world during these periods. But if you look at the far right side here, where you have the green curve, you see that uh, since roughly 2000, there's a sudden rise uh, in the CO2 level that is now exceeding what has been seen in the past 400,000 years. So this is exceeding historical trends. And this has nothing to do with the glacial uh, periods. This is the period since the, uh, the rise actually is timed from the uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which would be right about here, the mid-1700s, with the use first of coal uh, and then of uh, uh, electricity, but derived from coal, then uh, petroleum, et cetera, natural gas. So there's a sudden rise, and today the atmospheric level is at 400 parts per million and rising uh, more rapidly than expected. This has been challenged as to whether mankind has uh, contributed to this, and so there have been lots of studies. I'm just showing you the results of uh, uh, the summary of uh, one of these. Uh, so the, uh, on the left, we have the actual uh, data, and this is now not CO2 rise, but the effect on the climate, showing the temperature rise. The red line is the summary of 58 different simulations using 14 models, so it's a composite, and the uh, yellowish uh, wiggles around the black and red lines are the spread there. So you see no matter which model you use, whose simulation, the trend is upwards. And on the right, we see the same thing, but with the subtraction of the impact of humankind uh, addition to the CO2. So if uh, we were not uh, consuming fossil energy and converting it to CO2, we'd be following this uh, dark blue trend line, but in fact, we're following the black. Now, this doesn't look like a big rise. Uh, this is uh, less than uh, half a degree or so. But there are consequences. If we were to continue doing business as usual, you would follow the red line over here. And this is a result of uh, international studies that have been made on this topic. So that by the end of this century, uh, 2100, the uh, temperature rise would be three degrees. Well, it, you know, doesn't seem too bad. That's, you know, maybe survivable, but we'll see there are consequences. And if you could terminate things at roughly 2,000, you'd follow the orange line. 
And if you had what is called an integrated, ecologically friendly world, which means that each country develops according to its ability and population continues to increase, then you'd follow the blue line and you'd get up to maybe two degrees. So why be concerned? Well, here's a uh, plot that was given to me by uh, Don DePaolo. He's the head of the geosciences division at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab that projects out various consequences. So remember that today we're essentially right there, one degree, uh, and this is relative to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, possible rising yields in some high latitudes. Uh, uh, this is uh, um, a problem. Uh, small mountain glaciers disappear, water supplies threatened in several areas. Well, we know from uh, the uh, uh, people who survey these things that the glaciers are melting in the uh, Arctic. Uh, extensive damage to coral reefs because of acidification of the ocean. That's been seen. And then as you go out to the right, you see progressively more and more si significant uh, things. So by the time you get to three degrees, it's pretty severe. And what this is saying basically is uh, things are changing. Business as usual, you can do. It might be economically, uh, there might be economic incentives to keep doing what we're doing, but there are consequences. And really, we need to look at them. So the third point here is that the use of fossil energy as a principal source uh, has long-range consequences for the climate, which suggests that we need to look at alternatives. Okay, so uh, back to the outline. What should we do? And I'm going to suggest that we need to look progressively more and more at solar energy as the ultimate source of sustainable energy. So you do, you know, as chemical, chemical engineers are very good at doing macro-level bookkeeping on energy and mass. So here's a nice plot that reminds us that the, on the right, the non-renewable uh, energy resources, which are shown in these various colored spheres uh, here, uh, natural gas, uh, petroleum, uranium, coal, that if you were to add all of these up, you'd have 1,600, a little more than 1,600 terawatt years. So a terawatt or a watt is a measure of power. You multiply it by time, that gives you a measure of energy. So uh, we have that amount of reserve. We're using 16 terawatt years every year. This is worldwide. So you divide those two numbers, you have roughly a century of uh, uh, <coughs> uh, non-renewable resources. And you realize as you come to the end of your resources, their price is going to go skyrocketing up. Everybody's going to be competing for a uh, limited resource, <coughs> which means that those who have money will be able to get it. Those who don't will be fighting to have it. On the other hand, the sun over here will provide enough energy for roughly a thousand years. Uh, and uh, so it's a huge amount of energy that is uh, available, actually more than a thousand years. You can divide 16 into 23,000. So how can we use the sun? So here's one obvious way, and I think most of the audience are familiar with this. You could use the solar energy and photovoltaic converters based on silicon to generate electricity. Put it on the grid. Uh, yes, it doesn't, the sun doesn't shine at night. We, we, we are all aware of that. But you'd use uh, various forms of batteries to store the energy. And that energy can then be made available at night. So uh, this is a viable way to look at the future. Uh, there are parts of the world where the photovoltaics are becoming increasingly uh, popular in combination with wind power. And they will become uh, more popular as the capital cost drops. So right now, it's about $3 a watt installed. This is how much money you have to pay. So if you want to build a uh, 500 megawatt uh, plant, uh, you multiply by three, you're up at $1.5 billion for a plant of that size. And that's expensive. But once it drops within the next five years to about a dollar a watt, uh, this is affordable and uh, is becoming increasingly a likelihood. Uh, we've heard a lot about electric cars, and uh, here's uh, uh, one example uh, of a uh, 
battery-operated car uses a lithium-ion battery. Uh, what makes this, uh, it makes it, it's viable certainly to do, but what limits these kinds of cars from uh, uh, being on the road everywhere is the fact that the battery doesn't get you very far. If you just have a battery, no engine in the, in the car, uh, you can, in some cases with a small battery, drive 25, 40 miles, uh, Chevy Volt is I think 40 miles. Uh, if you're willing to pay $100,000 per car, you can buy a Tesla and you can drive 260 miles on a charge, but most of us aren't going to be doing this anytime soon. And the problem here is that uh, the lithium ion cells that we know today don't have enough energy density, as expressed in this uh, chart on the, uh, uh, on the left. And what the DOE has said is that we have to increase that fivefold to get there. Unfortunately, battery development and research is not as rapid as semiconductor research, which really skyrockets and gives us more and more powerful computers. Batteries are improving at about 5% per annum, which is pretty slow. So it's going to take a long time to get there. What are the alternatives? Well, here you look at a broader picture of energy density, either gravimetric, meaning per kilogram, or volumetric per liter. And it turns out that batteries uh, are not exactly zero, but on this scale, they're, they're very close to the origin over here, not much energy density. So the choices are to use something that has carbon. So you can think of, uh, uh, let me get the pointer working here, using ethanol. It's a little more than 20 megajoules per uh, liter. Uh, but it's not until you get up here towards gasoline and diesel that you really have uh, high energy density. And it's the high energy density that allows you to drive for a long distance. The other thing to realize is that while we might electrify the uh, fleet of cars used for transportation, especially locally, uh, it's not practical to do this for long-haul trucks, and certainly not practical to do this for, uh, for aviation. And that represents together about 28% of the fuel that we use. So whether you like it or not, uh, there will be carbon-based fuels in the future. The question is, how might we be able to make them without uh, using fossil energy uh, reserves? So the next thing I want to, uh, uh, to look at is might we consider using biomass as the source of carbon? So the basic idea here is that nature will take CO2 from the atmosphere, water from the atmosphere and from the ground, combine them in the presence of sunlight to make carbohydrates, CH2O and release oxygen. And that carbohydrate then is stored in grasses and uh, wood of trees. And there are many forms of these, uh, uh, this vegetation which will grow on land that's not suitable for agriculture for humankind, for, for food uh, production. So you could think of harvesting this material. And uh, that's shown over here. There, there's the tractor harvesting the material. Uh, let me back up here. Uh, taking the uh, material, let me get my pointer back, to a plant, converting it into biofuels, which will then uh, burn, and putting the biofuels, uh, the CO2 from the biofuels, back into the uh, atmosphere and closing the cycle. So in principle, this is a sustainable uh, operation. Yes, there are problems of getting the, the biomass from the farm, to the, uh, the plant where it's going to be processed. Uh, and yes, there are all sorts of questions about how you do this. So I'd like to take a few minutes to look at what are the alternatives. And can we do this with a minimum of land use and irrigation? The answer is yes, I won't dwell on this. But I will talk about whether you can do this with a net savings of CO2 emissions relative to looking at the alternative, which is to use fossil fuels. So let's take a quick look at biomass. It doesn't look anything like gasoline or diesel fuel. Uh, this is a micrograph on the left of a plant leaf after the water has evaporated and all the liquids are out. And <clears throat> it's composed of uh, some uh, cell wall tissues. Uh, there's pectin in there, which is a uh, 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 organic uh, polymer uh, enzymes, has enzymes in it. But the real energy storage comes in these rods of um, cellulose, 
over here, and hemicellulose, this is the true carbohydrate that has a formula of CH2O. Uh, so we have this structure, complex structure, which we have to take apart and convert into biomass. So here's a schematic of some alternatives. Uh, you could take the cellulosic biomass, uh, take out the lignin, which is an aromatic portion of it, take the hydrocarbons, uh, hyd uh, carbohydrates, and ferment them uh, to make ethanol, butanol, principal ones. This is known technology, and we'll see what the issues are with this in a moment. You could gasify the whole biomass, destroy the whole organic structure that nature put into it, and make synthesis gas, a mixture of CO, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen, and uh, reform these back into alkanes using Fischer-Tropsch uh, technology, uh, things that are being investigated here, or making methanol, or possibly hydrogen. You can go down to the other extreme and heat the biomass in the absence of air to do what is called pyrolysis. You make a, a, a black, gooey, gummy material, which is terrible to work with, but if you add hydrogen to it, you can stabilize it. And then you could co-process it together with petroleum in a refinery, but it is an expensive option and has many problems. You might think of using uh, fatty acids from oils and get methyl esters, make biodiesel, there's a small industry to do this, but you'll never make enough uh, diesel this way, it turns out. So I want to look at what are the issues here with the biological catalysis and then uh, suggest to you that there may be an alternative. So here's what you would do uh, if you're uh, using the biological route. The sun helps to grow the plants. You harvest the plants. You chop them up into little bits, dry them out. Uh, you do pretreatment. Uh, so this is one word for a lot of chemistry. It's a hard thing to do. You have to break apart the lignin from the carbohydrate with either weak acid or weak base or steam explode the plant. It's actually expensive technology. You have to use enzymes to cut up the carbohydrate polymer. So uh, cellulose is a polymer of, of um, uh, glucose. Uh, hemicellulose is a polymer of xylose and release these sugars. These enzymes cost money. Uh, now you got the sugars, then you ferment it with additional microbes to make fuels. And the problem is right now, all of this uh, costs about five to seven dollars a gallon uh, to make. That's the best uh, price. Whereas uh, uh, your, your uh, gasoline is selling for maybe three dollars uh, a gallon. But you have to realize that the energy density in the, in the uh, gallon of ethanol that you'd make this way is much lower than that of, uh, uh, of the um, gasoline. And so you have to multiply this uh, number of 5 to 7 by another 50%. So you're upwards towards maybe $10 a gallon. And we're not prepared to do that. And so this is not happening on a uh, particularly rapid uh, rate, particularly at $50 a barrel uh, oil. So what about chemical catalysis? That's this box here in red. So I'm going to show you what we've been looking at, <clears throat> which starts with sugarcane grown in Brazil. Uh, this sugarcane is milled into little pieces. Uh, hot water is used to extract the sucrose, from which you get all the sugar that we use in all, all sorts of foods. Uh, we then uh, uh, dehydrate the sugar into a chemical called 5-hydroxymethylfurfural. I'll show you the structure of that in a moment. What isn't sugar goes, is called bagasse. It's the waste. From that, you can extract the hemicellulose and get xylose. And from that, you can get furfural. And you can actually use the bagasse, the uh, waste organic product, to provide process heat. You can burn that. And if you don't uh, need that much process heat, you can generate electricity and sell it back to the grid. So here's the story in a little more detail. Here's the tractor collecting the sugar cane. Uh, below that is how sugar cane looks. And uh, in the middle is a blow up of what a sugar cane would look like if you cut it apart and looked under the microscope. But ultimately, we're after uh, uh, sucrose, which is this uh, uh, disaccharide composed of glucose and fructose. So you can hydrolyze this to make the two sugars. 
The bagasse has semicellulose, which uh, you can release xylose. So these three uh, sugars are the starting materials. And what you can do now, using an acid catalyst, is to dehydrate the sugars, which means take water out. That's good because you also take oxygen out at the same time, and water is not a bad byproduct. So you make these uh, final products, furfural and hydroxymethylfurfural. And ultimately, what I want to do is use these as building blocks, or what the chemists call synthons, to make products that are gasoline, C6 through C12 hydrocarbons, jet fuel, C12 through C18, diesel, uh, C11 to 22, and lubricants, which are C30 to C40. And I want to do it just with these two uh, starting materials that I've shown you in the box. Well, uh, the dehydration, I won't dwell on this. You can do uh, by using a combination of Lewis acid and Bronsted acid catalysts, and you extract the, the, uh, the furanic into an organic phase so it doesn't make uh, undesired uh, product called humans. And uh, just one example that you can do this efficiently is shown with tin chloride. So once you have the two molecules shown in the red box at the bottom of the slide, there are all sorts of directions that you can go that we have looked at. I'll just note, note two. One is to do the combination uh, to uh, uh, what we call furanization. We'll, we'll uh, trimerize the furan rings into uh, a molecule and hydrogenate it. And the material on the right here, this uh, 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 cyclohexan, uh, cyclohexyl ether uh, product, has a cetane number of 60, which is high. Anything above 50 is very good. And has an energy density exactly like that of uh, diesel. So that's one viable product. But we have found that going in this direction over here to this red box is even more attractive because we can make everything from diesel to jet to lubricant uh, using this chemistry. So this slide just reminds us that there are lots of different ways that we can get the, these, uh, uh, convert the uh, furanics into what are called methyl ketones. So look at the circled red boxes. So there's hexanone, pentanone, butanone, butanone again, pentanone, heptanone. So above the line are chemical pathways, below the line are biological pathways. We can use uh, either or both. Then we can do two bits of chemistry which work out to be quantitative. We can do 100% yields by taking, for example, hexanone. It'll dimerize over a, either a basic or an acidic catalyst to make either this trimer that has a, a cyclohexenone core or uh, one that has an aromatic core, a benzene ring in the middle, and then four arms, which are alkyl groups. And then with some hydrogen, we can hydrogenate either one of these two classes of products and make these derivatives that have cyclohexyl uh, cores and four alkyl arms. Now these materials turn out to uh, be very good, either jet or diesel fuels. What's even more remarkable is I can take a mixture of ketones and put them in the pot and co-condense them. And they, do, uh, they condense in a statistical manner so I get the kind of product distribution that I show you here on the, in uh, as part A or part B. This would be for jet, this would be for diesel. And we've actually retro-designed what we have to put in the pot by knowing what kind of boiling curve do we want to get. And this is the way the industry decides whether this is a good jet fuel or not. So we took this jet fuel over here, whoops, we took this jet fuel over here, got its boiling point, and then we said, what mixture of things do we have to put in the pot to emulate that? And we put them in, and we got what we wanted, and the same for the diesel. So these materials turn out to have the right energy density, the right, uh, what's called lubricity for the engine. It doesn't wear the engine too badly. And they're being tested by our sponsor, uh, BP, a British company, formerly known as British Petroleum. Uh, if we make the chains on the sides longer, then we can make lubricants. And lubricants are evaluated on the basis of uh, their um, uh, viscosity index, which is a measure of how much the viscosity changes with temperature. 
and the target is to have a number around 124, so this is commercial uh, lubricant. We can get up to 123 or even higher. The pour point, uh, which is the temperature at which the oil stops pouring, is uh, uh, we can match, uh, minus 72 degrees Celsius, and also the other properties. So this is, again, a product that is being looked at by BP as a commercially viable uh, material and, and for which uh, we have a, a process patent uh, uh, proposed. So the next question is, how can you envision a biorefinery in Brazil, starting with sugarcane, and does this biorefinery have a CO2 footprint that is smaller than the uh, petroleum-based refinery? So this is a lot to read, but I'll just guide you through the uh, uh, essential elements. So here are fertilizers and chemicals coming into the sugar cane supply to the farm. Uh, this is the diesel fuel to run the tractors. The cane is collected and milled. Uh, you separate out the, uh, the bagasse. Uh, you uh, generate with the bagasse the uh, heat and electricity you need. And then all the way down through here, are various chemical pathways that you use to produce the products that are shown in the boxes here. So here's jet fuel, lubricant, jet fuel again. Uh, somewhere there's diesel. Uh, uh, I guess this one doesn't show it. but uh, So you can make a mix of products. And so one of our collaborators has done what's called a life cycle analysis for greenhouse gas emissions. So you look at all the inputs and outputs of this process. And you ask, in, at the end of the day, does this process make more or less CO2 than you would have had if you'd made these products from petroleum? And what she has found is that if we uh, either maximize the reduction of greenhouse gases, maximize the uh, jet fuel production, or maximize the lubricant production, we're somewhere between uh, 40 uh, uh, we, we require 40 to, we put out 40 percent to 18 percent of the CO2 that you would have put out if uh, you used uh, uh, the uh, uh, petroleum. And the uh, reference point here is at the bottom of the slide. It's 90 grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule of fuel. This allows you to compare different kinds of fuels. Okay, so we can get the carbon from biomass, but at stages in the process, we need hydrogen. Where do we get that from? Well, you have basically three options. You can utilize the carbon from the biomass and, uh, and shift the hydrogen in the biomass to get rid of the uh, oxygen. So if you uh, start with uh, 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 glucose and ferment it to ethanol, the carbon is green, and you throw away uh, two thirds, one third of the total carbon as green CO2. I'm going to label my carbons either green or black here so we know whether it's good carbon or bad carbon. I could uh, convert this to an alkane. Again, I throw it out, one third CO2. I could use an external source of hydrogen and retain all the carbon in the product, which is what we do. But now I need to have a source of hydrogen. Today, the cheapest source of hydrogen is natural gas, methane, which you reform with water to make hydrogen and CO2. But now this, notice this CO2 is uh, uh, not nice because it's black, because it came from the ground. So that's fossil CO2. So that's not what you want to do. So the only other alternative is to split water using solar energy. And this would be good because it doesn't release any CO2. So this leads to another possibility, which is you use electrochemical generation of hydrogen. And this is being done, this is being explored in something called the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. This is the US's solar hub, sponsored by the DOE, and it's split between Caltech and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and involves also partnerships with Stanford and uh, University of California at Berkeley, Irvine, and San Diego. And so the big picture view is that you have a little device, which I'll show you in more detail in a moment, 
which takes in sun, produces hydrogen and CO2, and you would scale it up till it uh, covers uh, hectares of land over here mm -hmm. and produces hydrogen in an uh, uh, efficient and uh, economical way. So at the heart of this is this little device. It has uh, two absorbers. Uh, one on the top, at the, on the anode, which is a photoanode, takes photons in, creates what are called holes and electrons. The electrons are shipped south. The holes are used, the positive charge is used to oxidize water and produce protons. The protons are then allowed to cross over the uh, membrane. Let me get the pointer working right here. And they come on the other side and they encounter the photocathode where you're generating electrons, and the electrons are then used to neutralize the, uh, 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 the protons and convert that into hydrogen. And then farther out is to use those protons and electrons to reduce CO2 to methanol, something we're just starting to do today. So it turns out that all of this can be done, but uh, the uh, amount of energy you need to run this uh, cycle is um, more than the thermodynamic minimum. So this is shown with this cartoon. There's an anode and a cathode. The anode's producing oxygen. Cathode is producing uh, uh, hydrogen. Uh, and the, um, uh, the question now is, um, uh, uh, and I just noticed that I have my labels on the, uh, uh, these overpotentials reversed, but let me guide you through this. This should be on the right-hand side. The amount of energy the voltage that you need to uh, oxidize water, you need three-tenths to four-tenths of a volt more than you would expect based on thermodynamics. And uh, the uh, overpotential is lower for the generation of hydrogen. So uh, in this picture, the picture uh, cartoon is right. You need thermodynamically 1.23 volts. In fact, you need 1.6. So this is a loss of efficiency. And so the challenge has been to uh, make this red bar as small as possible. And that's something we've worked on. And we have found that one of the best materials involves earth abundant elements, nickel and iron. And you combine these and you can make a nickel iron oxyhydroxide, uh, so nickel iron OOH. And uh, the, this gives you the lowest possible uh, over potential. Uh, that we have been able to find, and then a benchmarking group within the Joint Center has looked at all sorts of other materials and finds that the best materials, which are down in this corner, all involve nickel and iron and sometimes another element. But they're, they're all giving about the same overpotential, about 0.35 uh, volts. And this has all been now cast into a prototype. So here you have what is called a louver type of uh, material where the uh, absorber is uh, in this blue uh, piece here and here. Uh, the uh, water vapor contacts it on one side and you generate uh, uh, oxygen. So here's the louver facing the solar uh, source. And in the second generation of these things, uh, we've been able to show that we can get 10% efficiency uh, with earth abundant materials. The uh, highest efficiency is 18% uh, that has been done, but not with uh, earth abundant uh, materials. So it shows that it's possible to develop this kind of device. So here's my picture. Uh, this is the last uh, slide before the end of uh, the future. On the left is the sun uh, growing biomass. Uh, biomass is harvested, uh, uh, processed, and produced fuels. The fuels are then used. The CO2 is released to the uh, atmosphere. So it's a closed cycle that, in principle, is sustainable. On the right, the sun is shining, but we're using it to uh, electrochemically uh, break up water. And we can also use wind power, which is shown in the lower part here, to provide this electricity. But the bottom line is that we produce hydrogen, which we could ship. Or we might just have a pipeline from here to there to provide the hydrogen for the removal of oxygen from biomass. So uh, we're coming to the end here. I want to make a few concluding remarks. And that is to say that continuing utilization of fossil energy resources contributes to the buildup of atmospheric CO2 
And that, in turn, is tied through the greenhouse gas effect to the global temperature rise. Solar energy offices an unlimited energy resource. Uh, it'll go on for thousands of years. So our children, grandchildren, many generations in the future will be able to benefit from that. Photovoltaic uh, electricity generation is coming down in price, capital cost and uh, operating cost, so it's going to be competitive with gas and coal burning. Biomass can be converted to transportation fuels and lubricants with a greatly reduced CO2 footprint, so that's good news. There are still technical problems, though. And solar radiation in combination with electrochemical splitting of water can be, produced, can be used to produce hydrogen without co-production of CO2. Something you can't do today if you're using natural gas as your source of hydrogen. And finally, really far out in the future, uh, CO2 recovery from the atmosphere and its reduction to fuels, for example, um, uh, methanol, using solar energy represents a grand challenge for producing carbon-based fuels uh, for future generations. So I want to end by thanking uh, graduate students and postdocs in my group who worked on the technical aspects that I highlighted here. It's a very um, pleasant group of young people that I've had the pleasure to work with. And uh, the, this research has been funded by two groups. One is the Energy Biosciences Institute, funded by BP. This is a uh, $50 million a year institute split between Berkeley and University of Illinois. And uh, JCAP, or the Joint Center for Artificial uh, Photosynthesis, is a $25 million a year center uh, funded by DOE. And again, this is center is split largely between uh, the Berkeley uh, site and the Caltech side. So uh, this brings me to the end of my story. It's been a pleasure visiting here. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.